We have learned many surprising things about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. Let's look at some new research hinting that dust could play a role in transmission and that keeping your voice low can reduce the risk. I'm Lee Kelso. This is Health Call Live Online, the place for extended interviews with guests heard on our regular weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Live Radio Hour. This new research is the work of Professor William Riston Part and his colleagues at the Department of Chemical Engineering, UC College Davis, uh, that is the UC Davis College of Engineering out in California. Professor, good to have you here. Thanks. Thank you for having me here. You bet. Let's start with uh, how keeping your voice low helps protect those around you. What's the takeaway from your research on the spread of the virus in a noisy environment? Sure, so I think a key thing that a lot of people don't realize is that when you're talking, like right now, as I'm saying, uh, you don't see anything, but you're actually emitting a tremendous number of what's known as expiratory aerosol particles. So they're about one micron, one millionth of a meter in size, way too small for you to see with the naked eye, but plenty large to carry the virus. And there's a lot of evidence now that speech and vocalization in general can contribute to airborne transmission of COVID-19, as well as other respiratory viruses. So I think we, we learned that with that outbreak in the choir in the state of Washington. I just saw a study mm -hmm. out of uh, Sweden that also emphasized that uh, uh, words with heavy consonant sounds that create even more spread. Um, <laughs> So what does that tell uh, us? How do, yeah. we, how do we apply that information practically to uh, trying to minimize spread of this disease? Well, what my colleagues and I did, we did some research in 2018, well before the pandemic, looking at counting the number of expiratory particles emitted uh, as a function of how loud you were, and also as a function of what you actually say. And what we found is that certain, uh, certain phonemes, certain sounds, uh, do emit more expiratory particles than others. Um, and so, for example, a plosives, uh, like, like the letter P is a plosive. So if you say papa, that releases about a factor of two more aerosol particles than saying the word fafa. Uh, F is a fricative. And so those have different fluid mechanics associated with them. And you can have about a factor of two difference uh, in the um, amount of particles that are emitted. But that difference actually is swamped out by seemingly minor differences in how loud you are. So in other words, if you say fafa very loudly, it'll completely swamp out saying papa at a lower loudness. Um, and so what our uh, research indicates is that for every six decibel reduction in how loud you are, you actually cut the number of expiratory particles that you're emitting in half. And so that means that you're effectively reducing the transmission risk risk by a factor of two. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, that would that would then lead me to believe that um, being in a crowded gymnasium during a uh, basketball game uh, <laughs> where people are shouting and having a great time is is going to be putting me at greater risk. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like, so that choir practice, for example, that you mentioned, that was, I, I believe it was two and a half hours 87% of the people in that room got infected. Um, and what are they doing in a choir practice? They're, they're vocalizing, they're singing. Um, and so when you sing, when you just say, ah, uh, right now, you can't see it, but there's now a cloud of expiratory particles in front of my face. And those are so small that even though gravity is working on them, they're lightweight enough that they can float around in very minor air currents uh, through the room. And then somebody on the other side of the room eventually can inhale them. Now they're in their lungs, they're infected. Uh, boy, this is not at all what we thought, uh, how this disease spread just, just a few months ago, is it? So early on, uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on fomite transmission, you know, via contaminated handshakes and things like that. But uh, there, there's so much indirect evidence um, now that it's airborne transmission that, you know, the CDC and the World Health Organization have really emphasized that it's direct person to person transmission uh, through the air. And there's still a lot of uncertainty about exactly how it gets through the air. And I think, and this is really important, a lot of people, when they go and look at media reports about airborne transmission, almost invariably, uh, the editors choose a picture of somebody sneezing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what I like to point out to people is that A, sneezing is not even a symptom of COVID-19. Uh, B, the globs of stuff you see when somebody sneezes, relatively speaking, those are huge. If you can see them with your eye, 
um, they're big enough to fall out of the air by gravity, you know, within that six foot distance that we heard so much about. But also a sneeze and like I, I'm trying to emphasize, even talking, uh, like that vocalization, that's emitting thousands of micron scale expiratory particles you can't see that can carry the virus. Yeah, that's a, that's a big change from what we originally thought. You mentioned the word fomite, and uh, let's explain that to people. So these are inanimate objects that can carry the virus, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the classic definition of a fomite is, for example, a doorknob. Somebody who's infected gets virus on their hand, they touch the doorknob, they walk away, then you come along and you, you use the doorknob. Now it's on your hand and you infect yourself. The doorknob served as a fomite, a contaminated surface uh, where the pathogen was. And that's where your research uh, involving dust comes in. So you found that those particles that we emit can attach themselves to dust and then spread? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, for many years now, my colleagues and I uh, at UC Davis and at the Mount Sinai School of, of Medicine uh, in uh, New York uh, were investigating influenza transmission and we're using uh, animal models there. And so, uh, the main assumption for years um, in animal model research for influenza has been that, you know, one, an infected guinea pig, for example, breathes out respiratory droplets that then travel to a guinea pig that's susceptible in a separate cage, and then they breathe it in and get infected. And what we found is that it looks like what's actually happening is that the infected guinea pig doesn't really emit many expiratory particles. Uh, very few actually and what they do do though is they groom themselves they lick their paws they get um you know uh, their saliva and their mucus everywhere all around the cage we went and sampled the cage it's on their ears it's on their paws it's on the cage and those surfaces also generate a lot of dust so every time the guinea pig moves around there's a big burst in the number of particles again micron scale particles in the air and we, we believe is that those are carrying the virus through the air to the susceptible guinea pig. And so this, what we call this is an aerosolized fomite. So the solid surfaces, the fur, uh, the, the bedding, those served as fomites, but then they aerosolize. And I, I think the thing that was kind of uh, most compelling is that we um, took this idea and thought, okay, well, I guess we don't need an animal at all. And so what we did was we took a Kleenex, you know, a paper facial tissue contaminated it with influenza and then just simply rubbed it rubbed it very gently with our fingers and again our intuition breaks out you can't see anything you don't see any dust you don't see anything happening but just by rubbing a paper tissue very gently it's actually aerosolizing thousands up to a thousand particles per second in the micron range and what we showed with our experiments is that they can these particles can carry viable influenza virus that can infect cells so your research did not involve the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but is there any reason to suspect that it would behave differently than the flu virus? Well, we, we yeah, we did all this research before SARS-CoV-2 existed, um, but uh, <clears throat> the viruses they're they're very they're very different biologically, but they do share the feature that they're both about the same size. Um, they're both respiratory pathogens, and so what our work with influenza does is it raises the possibility that. SARS-CoV-2 could potentially also be transmitted via this aerosolized fomite uh, pathway. That, so th that, that's a hypothesis that needs to be investigated. Yeah, I get that. So your, your Kleenex example, though, uh, strikes me as evidence that if you have a COVID patient in the house, everything, everything, needs to be treated with great care. And think about think about the, the PPE in the hospital when they're donning and doffing, as it's called, putting on, taking off. That's the moment of greatest risk to the employee, but also to everybody around them. They need to be doing that in an area where, gosh, that virus could just be spreading based on those microparticles. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was a paper in Nature um, a couple, uh, three months ago, I guess now, where they went and ran and did air sampling in hospitals in China and they found some of the highest SARS-CoV viral counts, not in the patient rooms, but in the rooms where the healthcare workers were, as you say, doffing their PPE. And so, you know, just taking off a shirt, just even rubbing, rubbing your shirt like that, that aerosolizes dust particles. And if that surface has been contaminated, 
uh, either with the patients or, or somebody else's, you know, uh, the virus that they emitted somehow, then just again, rubbing it can get that into the air. <laughs> wow. So let me ask you about this. That would indicate to me that we need to increase ventilation in spaces. For example, let's talk about schools. Is it practical then to assume that if you increased ventilation and added an additional layer of filtration that you would reduce the potential viral exposure? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I've been recommending to, for months now that people invest in air purifiers. Um, and that sounds fancy, but like basically you can get one for about $100 on Amazon. They're literally just a fan with a HEPA filter installed in it. And all it does is it sucks in the air from the room, sends it through a filter, and basically scrapes out all the micron scale particles, including ones that could potentially be carrying virus. They're stuck on the filter and it pumps clean air into the room. Um, and so a few months ago, I was talking to a reporter from uh, Texas and the schools there were considering investing very heavily in face shields. You know, so not, not even masks, but just like, you know, those plastic face shields over your face. Um, and the, the point that I raised there was like, well, that prevents, you know, spray transmission. So like when you, if the student coughs or sneezes, the big droplets will actually hit the spray shield. But again, our intuition breaks down for the aerosol particles. When you cough or sneeze at the spray shield, you do block the big droplets, but these tiny micron scale aerosol particles completely miss it. It's actually in aerosol science, it's, very, it's a well-known thing. It's very difficult to make a micron scale particle actually impact onto a solid surface. So what happens is those particles go out and just flow right around. The, probably the best analogy uh, is to think about cigarette smoke. You know, could you block cigarette smoke with a face shield or, you know, a plastic partition between desks? Uh, and the short answer is no. I mean, like, it'll slow it down a little bit, but the smoke is going to go right around it. Same thing with these microscale aerosol particles. So to your question, yes, what you need to do is you need to increase the ventilation rate. That's what will ultimately suck all that stuff out of there. And if you have air purifiers, filtration, that also removes pathogens. Well, I think that's huge with holiday gatherings coming up and people being confined and, you know, you're in California, uh, so you don't have to deal with the cold weather back here in the Midwest. We do. Just just, just fires and smoke and ash. Yeah, yeah that's all you have to fight, right? Exactly. Mm. Uh, but back here, so I'm thinking about those holiday gatherings. And so am I silly to think that I need to keep windows open in the kitchen, dining room, and those places and maybe have an air purifier? Is that going overboard or is, does that make sense based on your research? So if, if you're in your own social pod, if it's just your family um, and nobody's infected, then you don't need to uh, worry about it as much. But any situation where you're contacting other people outside of your bubble, um, then I would worry about that. So, for example, when I uh, my parents had their 45th wedding anniversary recently, and like we insisted that everything be outdoors. Outdoors is much safer uh, than indoors because the the viral load can't can't accumulate outdoors; it just floats away. Um, so we insisted on being everything outdoor, and like uh, I we went and put air purifiers inside the house. So when people had to use the bathroom, there was something in there to help it clean up the air. Um, and so that's for that type of um, social gathering, when you have people brought together from different, you know, social bubbles, uh, I would recommend taking those precautions. Opening the windows increases natural ventilation, uh, have fans going, have bathroom fans going, invest in a couple air purifiers um, for more crowded places inside. Um, that, that I would strongly recommend all those. That's, uh, that's real interesting. We've not, we've not heard that uh, in the general media at all yet. Is it? It's you know are they catching I, up now? Is that are they we're just ahead of the curve here? I um I don't like to sound critical, but I would say I think it's hard to argue that we're not behind the curve. Um, and so uh, I've been putting together an outreach video talking about all these uh, issues, and I find lots of examples in the foreign press talking about, for example, how air conditioning can spread um, the virus and infect people. There was an outbreak in a Starbucks in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, one person happened to be sitting in front of a ductless air conditioning unit. So basically all it does is it sucks in warm air in the room and blows out cold air. And so that, that doesn't filter it. It doesn't provide any fresh air. This infected individual sat in front of that for a couple hours and ultimately infected more than 50 people. Um, and so it's, I think, yeah, I, for whatever reason, uh, there's been, um, I think, a lot 
more resistance here to the idea of airborne transmission, but there's a lot of compelling evidence that it is these micron scale aerosol particles. And because I think a lot of people's intuition breaks down, they're like, and again, <laughs> the media representation is always somebody sneezing. And that makes th people think as long as I avoid the sneeze, I'm okay. Um, and that's not necessarily true. These particles can go really far all the ways across the room um, and infect other people. Have you, have you done any research into uh, how long those particles are active once they're airborne? So, for example, you know, we heard in, in the surface contamination in the, you know, as we just called it, the fomite contamination, those viruses can live a period of hours in, a good con in ideal circumstances. What about airborne? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, actually we do. Uh, not me, but uh, other people have uh, investigated that in detail. Uh, a result from a few months ago, they showed that aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 uh, survives for hours. Um, and so that's, that's an indoor environment. Uh, more recent research has shown that like when it's outdoors or exposed to sunlight, the half-life uh, shrinks dramatically to about six minutes. So that's another reason outdoors is safer. Uh, the UV light from the sun uh, apparently like deactivates the virus very quickly. But that doesn't happen indoors. Indoors, it's protected. And so you have kind of two effects. It's like the, there, there's nothing kind of killing the virus. And it, uh, if you have especially low ventilation rates, it can, the concentration of uh, virus can build up and really maximize the odds that a susceptible individual will inhale it and become infected. Man, you're really scaring me here. I, I've been uh, going to the gym at off hours when there are just a handful of people there thinking I'm doing myself a favor, but... If well, all no, that aerosolized that, stuff is there from from you know can float around for hours. That's that's well, kind of scary. So that that's that's the let me let me clarify. That's the biological half life. Um, it it survives in the air for hours. But in a typical gym, unless your gym is negligent, they should have a very high ventilation rate. And so a very important phrase is the air changes per hour. Mo gyms in most municipalities by code have to have you know a very large number of air changes per hour. If nothing else, is to replace the oxygen, pull out the carbon dioxide. From all the people exercising and so actually in that situation what controls the concentration of the virus in the air is the ventilation rate so the higher the air changes per hour the more quickly it's pulled out of the space and so what you said i think is is, is wise if you go there when there's less people then the odds of one of those people being infected and you know spewing stuff out into there is much lower so i if i had to choose i would do exactly what you did i'd go when the gym is not crowded versus when it is crowded um, what's something else that we haven't considered that your research leads us to want to focus on? Well, this goes back to one of your earlier questions, which is the effect of how loud you are. Um, and so the, you know, what our research very clearly shows is the louder you are, the more expiratory particles will come out. Um, and so one very inexpensive and I think easy to implement public health uh, mitigation approach would be just recommend people use quieter voices, recommend that you have, uh, you know, quiet zones, especially in high risk environments like uh, like hospital waiting rooms um, or dining facilities, things like that. If people just talk less, they're putting less of these expiratory particles out into there. If there's less particles, then it's less likely somebody else will inhale them. And it, what our research suggests at least is it's not a minor effect. Uh, six decibels is not a huge difference in how loud you are. So it's it's almost for a lot of people it's it's a kind of a subtle difference, and but our research shows that like it it, it plummets you know a six decibels reduction it's a factor of two, um, and so if people just talk more quietly then that would uh, decrease the probability of transmission, and so that's what I would I would urge people to think about that in more detail. And I think then we also need to be considering. Um I'm going back to your Kleenex example here. When I take my mask off, um, how I handle it and what I do with it is also important because I'm just unleashing a cloud of those virus potentially. Well, yeah, so it, it, if, you're, if you're already infected, then you're not gonna get reinfected by your own right. virus, but the concern is for other people, right? Of course. Um, and also, if, for example, if you're, um, if you're somebody in your family is sick like in, you know, and they leave the bedroom, I wouldn't assume that just because they're not in the room anymore, that I'm safe. And especially if you change the sheets, they've also done sampling of hotel rooms uh, with patients who have subsequently been known to be infected with, with COVID-19 and found that uh, or recovered virus from like the pillows and the duvet cover and the sheets um, more so than like some of the 
places people worry about, like the TV remote and things like that. Um, and it's known that, like, you know, again, shaking the blanket or whatever, that can aerosolize stuff. Hmm. So I, I would, again, I think that there's kind of like this kind of media promulgated, you know, misconception, not, maybe not purposely uh, mispromulgated, but like it's out there anyway. So like this idea that somebody's going to sneeze on you in the face for it to happen. Um, and that's, that's really not what the evidence suggests. Like you can have um, these kind of longer range aerosol transmission, presumably with, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, mostly from expiratory particles, but with this possibility of the aerosolized fomites as well. We've uh, we've about come to the end of our time. Is uh, is there anything I didn't ask you? You think is important people consider and think about? Yeah, I'll just I'll just reiterate. I mean, like people's intuition breaks down for these micro scale particles, and it's probably much better to think about transmission risk in terms of how far cigarette smoke would go. So if you see somebody and you're thinking, oh, there's, if they were smoking a cigarette, would I smell it? If the answer is yes, uh, then that you're you're uh, exposed, you're at risk. I'm not going to say that's a comforting thought, but I do appreciate spending time with you today. Uh, it's my, my pleasure. That is Professor William Riston part. Uh, he's at the Department of Chemical Engineering, UC Davis College of Engineering. Thanks for being with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lee.